Well, hello everybody. Hi, this is Stefan Tagmeister. You catch me in my studio right here in New York City, uh, the epicenter, at least the US epicenter of this strange time. Uh, and uh, we are Miss Domestica and I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, myself. So, I'm Stefan, uh, I'm Austrian. I live since almost 30 years now in New York City. I run a design studio here called Sagmeister Inc. And uh, I've been also doing that for a long time. I think the studio is now 27 years old. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about my beginning. So I uh, was born in a small town in the Austrian Alps, in Bregenz, very pretty on a lake uh, in the middle of the not so high Alps, but very close to the border of Switzerland. Uh, I grew up not being a big drawer, meaning I did not excel in uh, drawing class, neither in, uh, neither in grade school nor in junior high school. And, but then roughly when I was 14 or 15, I played in bands terribly, terribly. Uh, I also sang really awfully. And uh, at, the same at the same time started to write for a local magazine. And at that magazine, because nobody was really interested in doing the layout of that magazine, I tried it and it turned out that I liked doing the layout better than the writing. So. I took that over and because the magazine was somewhat culturally active and interested uh, and, you know, created or organized all sorts of concerts and festivals, uh, all these things needed posters. And so basically because I already did the layout, that also fell into my lap. And that really was my first sort of baby steps. This was, of course, all before the computer, so a lot of it was done with letter sets, a lot of type, or with just basically an IBM electric typewriter. And then because the letter set uh, sheets were quite expensive and we had really no money, so we got them donated from other uh, design companies. And because it was such a pain uh, to redraw the ease that were always invariably missing from those sheets. We, uh, there was a lot of hand uh, drawing of the headlines, uh, which I think sort of put me uh, on my way. I then studied in Vienna uh, at the University for Applied Arts, uh, worked quite a bit on freelance jobs, mostly in the cultural world with my fellow students, and then uh, got a scholarship to study some more at Pratt Institute in New York City. Uh, went back to Austria for a year. Then really I felt it was sort of time to grow up and I went to Hong Kong to basically work in a more corporate environment uh, uh, for two years. Uh, for a, I opened a small design studio for a very large advertising agency. Uh, there in Hong Kong, and it, these two years were probably the most commercial work that I've ever done with, with mostly luxury products, an airline, two hotel chains, a fancy department store. And uh, I feel that it was incredibly important for me to be there because I learned a lot. I also had a chance to work with higher budgets and sort of try out all sorts of complex printing techniques and production possibilities, learn how to art direct and all of this stuff. But ultimately, I think that maybe the most valuable thing that I learned in Hong Kong was about all the things that I never really wanted to do again in my life. And uh, I came back to New York and worked for my absolute hero, for Tibor Kalman, who at the time ran a design company called Emmett Co. I was there for a fairly short time because Tibor uh, closed Emmett Company 
in order to move to Rome and do Colors magazine, that's Benetton magazine that uh, he sort of invented uh, to do that full time. And considering at that time, ML Company was my favorite design company in all of New York, uh, it made sense, it really makes sense to now work for my second favorite. So I opened my own design company. Uh, this was in 1993, and it already had the subtitle that said design for the music industry. Basically, this idea that I wanted to combine my two loves in my life, on the one hand, music, on the other hand, uh, uh, on the other hand, design. And of course, we didn't have a single music client, but I did go out and interviewed with all of the record labels and showed them the work. And they all said, yes, we're going to give you work. Your portfolio is good. But really, nothing came from that at all. And it was only when we designed an album cover for a band, for a very really small band, where I knew the lead singer, who was a, uh, an acquaintance, a friend. By now, he's a very good friend, and we're still very, very good friends. The band was called HB Synchro, and we did their cover. And that cover was nominated for a Grammy. And that made the big change. So basically, since we were able to, since we got that Grammy nomination, the record labels took us much more seriously. And we then tended to get a whole bunch of jobs. It's sort of like, I think the first well known artist that we worked for that I really loved was Lou Reed, who was a neighbor. He worked very close. And from there, we got very fast. We worked for David Byrne, we worked for Talking Heads, we worked for the Morning Stones. So uh, it was definitely sort of amazing that we could open up a studio with that in mind and that it would actually, not immediately, but sort of after a year or so, it would actually work. And we, on the side, we always did here and there a commercial job. Uh, they still tended to pay uh, a better rent. You could do them somewhat faster. But ultimately, definitely in those first years, I would say the first seven or so years, we definitely concentrated on music. Uh, many great stories, events happened during that time. Uh, you know, like uh, flying to Los Angeles to meet up with the Rolling Stones and discuss their album cover uh, was definitely a kick. And uh, in the case of the Stones, Mr. Jagger was very, very much in charge of the whole process. So it was literally him and Charlie Watts, the drummer, and myself who met up several times or were on uh, uh, at phone conversations which made the whole thing much easier because there was no management of the band or no uh, record label really involved. At the same time, it was surprising to me how many difficult routes Mick Jagger sent me down, uh, particularly because the Stones had a fantastic history of very good album covers, you know, some Girls uh, by Peter Thorson or Sticky Fingers by Andy Warhol, some of my favorite covers of all time. Um, of course, both of them also containing really, really good music. Uh, by the time we came along, it was also, I would say, a little bit more difficult because Jagger at that point had very, very much realized that the that the Stones actually can make more financial gains through the cover than they do through the music. And the way this crazy sounding statement comes around is because the cover is sort of the initial visual identity for hundreds and hundreds of merchandising articles. From the very, very beginning, Jagger said that he wants some sort of Simple, something that will look good on a baseball cap. And what you see right here, this sort of like on his hind leg standing Assyrian lion was really produced on anything from gigantic banners uh, for the stadium all the way down to pencil sharpener and eraser kits and everything in, uh, uh, in between. 
we did go to the opening show of the Bridges to Babylon tour in uh, uh, in Chicago. And I would say, even though I have to admit, it's not one of my favorite covers, and I don't think that we were able to create as good of a cover as other people did, the process was still uh, uh, fun to be part of. Uh, and then, of course, it turned out that the 25th album cover wasn't as much fun to do as the first one. So after six or seven years of this, no repetition set in. And even though it was my own studio, I could do with it whatever I wanted. We did the kind of jobs that I set out to do. It felt repetitive. And this sort of like over the course of a year became worse and worse. And I decided to implement the first sabbatical, meaning closing the studio, recording an, a message on the answering machine. At that point, we still had answering machines that basically said, you know, call us in a year from now. And it, this was, that first one was a very scary proposition. I felt people will think it was, it would be unprofessional. This was in the year 2000, so at the very height of the first internet boom. Uh, it, I felt that we would probably lose all of our clients. I felt that, uh, that we probably would have to completely do a restart after all of this. And as so always, I so often with my other assumptions that it, none of this turned out to be reality-based. Uh, Lou Reed actually even moved his release date of his album so that we could still, af right after we opened, uh, design his new album cover. And it all turned out to be uh, wonderful. In fact, actually, we got much more press in the year where we were not working about not working than we ever got before. Uh, and I'm now looking back onto the trajectory of the studio, really much, very much see the studio as sort of the first seven years, years of medical, the second seven years, years of medical, the third seven years, because the trajectory of the studio always changed because of the things that came about during the sabbatical. Uh, the second seven years were much more sort of oriented about designing things for organizations, quite a lot of, uh, of charities, uh, things that were close to my heart, uh, but also some commercial organizations. And then the second sabbatical was in Bali uh, that yielded a whole new body of work there, I mean, apart from doing furniture and all sorts of stuff, uh, while on sabbatical in Indonesia, in Bali, it, we also is, uh, started uh, like a big new project, which would be the happy film. And we just started it there, so basically the bulk of the work was done when the studio was fully functioning again uh, in New York City. And as a offshoot of that, uh, of that happy film, where we also designed an exhibition called The Happy Show that in many ways almost eclipsed the original project, The Happy Film. And uh, I would say that now if I look back onto the worthwhile projects or projects that I think from a investor advantage of hindsight were really meaningful for me to do. I would say that most of the projects came out of some sort of sabbatical context. So that was really, really helpful. Uh, and I would say that to any designer, I would very highly recommend to integrate a certain amount of time into their daily life that is projects that they really would want to do themselves. Personal projects, they can be 
fake client projects, but things basically, if you want to use a fancy name, basically R&D, trying stuff out to improve directions. And I think that I think every designer that I really admire does some sort of version of this. Some do it, you know, very planned, like myself with the one year sabbatical, but some other people do like, you know, two hours every day, or they do Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or they do some sort of system that is really reserved for research and development, uh, or personal work, whatever uh, you want to call that. Uh, so I think that that's sort of like, that's really would be a big recommendation. Uh, if you do that, uh, I since a number of years now have a dedicated Instagram account that uh, that is looking at work and also reviewing it very short, like you know, one, two, three sentences. Uh, if you are if you have a project that you wanna have reviewed, uh, send it uh, to me. All the the information is part of that Instagram account. The Instagram account is my name, Stefan Sagmeister. No space in between the first name and the last name. Uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, I see we are roughly 20 minutes into it. So I think, meaning I can, of course, talk here forever, but I think we are ready, or I'm definitely ready, to uh, sort of like start with some questions. And uh, as soon as uh, they are copied into my uh, chat here, I will uh, start that. So question one is, how can you be sure you are going on the right path studying design? Hmm. Let me think back to the time when I was a student. I actually, I have to say, in this case, I was quite lucky because I do remember being quite sure that I wanted to study design. Or I actually, you know what? I'm not sure if I was right about, uh, sure about that, but I definitely was sure that I wanted to get better at it. Like in that time, uh, very much when I was in art school, there was a, a big desire within me just basically to get better. And because I was so terrible, the steps were clearly visible. Meaning like if I did drawing exercises, you know, and I did them on really crappy paper, you know, on top of each other, and you went back a month and saw how your hands drawing was a month ago to now, you clearly saw a difference. It was not a straight curve that was always going up. There were days when the drawings turned out to be terrible, but ultimately if you looked back a month, the drawing from now was better than a month ago. And the same was still even true for, let's say, posters. A poster that I designed in year three in art school uh, was clearly better than the one in the beginning. And now, I'm not even sure if art school is necessary, but it makes it easier. And I would say for me, the most important was not necessarily the faculty, even though we definitely learned from there, but it was much more about the community between the students. I went to an art school in Vienna that had a good reputation. So the, 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 the quality of the students it attracted was, was good. And we, of course, measured ourselves constantly against each other. And I think I'm, I'm teaching now and I think this is still very, very much true. And I think that, you know, the 20 students that I teach here in New York, they, I feel that they learn at least as much from each other, maybe more than they do from me. Okay. Uh, do you think it is, uh, I have here one from uh, uh, Denise. Now, do you think it is more important to stay updated on design trends or to polish your own design style and continue on that path? Well, I would say that if you're a young designer and you, you know, you're learning, let's say you're, uh, you're either in design school or you're taking online courses, 
I don't think that you should be very much worried about developing your style. I think that style will come all by itself and it will be much more difficult to get rid of it again than it was to acquire it. So I would not, basically, I would not make that a clear goal or a direction to develop your own style. It will come by itself if you work really properly and hard on it. And as far as design trends is concerned, I think that every designer should know what is going on. I do believe that certain kinds of design, specifically short-lived design, and much of communication design is short-lived. So if you design a microsite that's going to live for a month or two, that microsite should probably be of its time, meaning if I use a, uh, uh, a slightly more uh, uh, negative word, that can be trendy because it's, it only lives for now anyway and it's going to be gone. So it should be, its look should also be, this has been designed now. While if you design an identity for a company that should live for 50 years, obviously that strategy should be completely different. Um, Yeah, I hope I answered this one. Then from Tancho Gonzalez, how long does a branding process take for you? Well, we are slow. We try, also, I mean, oh, let me rephrase this. I myself right now am not involved in any more branding projects. This is not because I think they're not important. Uh, this is more because similar than the album covers, I just feel I've done enough of them and I want to move on to other things. So basically, since last summer, all of the commercial work was really put on the shoulders of my very capable partner, former partner, uh, Jessica Bolch, and I really only do self-initiated work, or if it's commissioned work, it's commissions that don't really have a, uh, a brief uh, per se. But of course, in my life, we did many, many, many branding jobs. And we always took a minimum of three months between the time we were briefed and the time we showed the first proper brand presentation. Uh, we uh, worked very hard on that presentation. We only showed the client one direction, even though as we worked on it, of course, we developed sometimes a dozen. But it, we always felt it was part of our job to really sort this out and then uh, make the decisions what the best strategy to communicate that brand for the client would be. You see, like uh, we always felt that the client knows their business much better than we do, but we actually do know better how to communicate that business than the client does. And it's I Meaning it would be extremely sad if it wouldn't be that way. I've been, you know, dedicating a significant part of my life, maybe the biggest part of my life, to design. So it would be awful if I wouldn't be better at it than somebody who didn't who didn't do that. So uh, we show one, uh, we show only one uh, direction, but we warned the client before that. That, that's that's uh, how we will do it. And if we are completely wrong, we talk, we use that direction to talk about all the aspects that are wrong about it. And then we redesign a completely new direction for no extra cost. And in the almost three decades that we've been doing this, there was never a single case where we didn't nail it at least in the second time. And very often we nailed it in the first time. All right, then there is a question. How do you see the future of the design profession? I see it rosy. I think that, meaning I myself obviously love design. I think that it's a great, so it's a great job. Uh, not every day and not always, but ultimately, I think because the field is so wide now, it's just so big. I mean, we found ourselves designing or creating a movie in the morning 
a piece of furniture in the uh, at noon and working on a, on a, some promotional project or a website or a, or a keychain uh, in the afternoon. So it's extremely wide. It doesn't get very quickly boring. I think that there might be a time in the future when computers will learn how to make serious aesthetic decisions and will take another part of what we do away from us. But at the same time, I think that if you think as a designer, the there will always, even with technology and artificial intelligence, in artificial intelligence uh, developing, there will always be a reason for a person to design the artificial intelligence program, the AR world, the VR world. So I don't see any shortage of work for designers coming anytime soon. And you know, I would say the immediate future, of course, we already see that everything that can be animated will be animated. Uh, I see a quite, you know, two movements going on at the same time, of course, uh, digital uh, very much rules, but at the same time, also very young designers are kind of being frustrated by sitting in front of a screen all day long. So there is, it is, there is also a sort of like a movement towards the handmade, to, or definitely I would say that within communications, a desire to, communi to create pieces that are clear that a human being has made them. Because so much of what is graphic design or communication design, specifically online, looks like it's being made by a machine. And that is ridiculous. I mean, who wants to talk to a machine? It's, uh, it's like the equivalent of calling a, a company and uh, being answered by one of these, you know, answering computers, press one for Spanish, press two for English, and so forth and so on. Uh, nobody wants to communicate like that. Uh, meaning my own pet peeve, I think, in that world is the neglect of beauty in vast areas of design. This is not just true for graphics or communication. This is true for architecture. This is true for product design. And it is unbelievably true for online. I mean, basically, so much of the online world is extremely cold and still based on design principles created in the 1920s in Germany at the Bauhaus or, uh, you know, let's say by Jan Chico when it comes to typography and layout design. And even though people like Chico, like Max Bill, the people, the giants who invented that stuff, 20, 30 years later, thought, thought that their own manifests, their own books, in the case of Chico, the Neue Typography, that they were basically much too narrow-minded. And Chico called his, called his own work partially fascist. It was sort of too late, and so many, so many designers found, I don't know, solace in the world of function. You know, all these people who call themselves problem solvers, that aesthetics kind of fell underneath the table in many ways. And I do think that that's a huge mistake because if we are surrounded by beautiful things, this could be prints, this could be online things, this can be, uh, this can be products, this can be spaces, this can be neighborhoods, cities, we actually not only feel better, but we also behave better. And this is not just an opinion of mine, but it's actually provable. Uh, we actually have a, an exhibition running right now. Well, it's not running right now. It closed in Hamburg, and it might open 
on June 26 in Austria in Bregenz in my hometown, the first exhibition in my hometown ever, uh, but it may not, uh, considering the circumstances, but it generally definitely will go on. It uh, already was in three different museums and it will definitely as uh, we hopefully at one point will go back to a more normal time. Uh, uh, will continue and we show in that exhibition that also this very scientific data that it that beauty actually makes a difference. The, the uh, scientific uh, advisor uh, that we are working with, Dr. Helmut Leder, he actually thinks that beauty is a shortcut for the brain to make a quick decision. So if he's right, then it would play a gigantic role in the commercial work because we do that all the time. We switch from one website to the other. We go to the supermarket, look at 10 different kinds of orange juice. Of course, if the brain makes the decision according to which the brain finds its, mo finds it, its most aesthetically appealing, then, it would, then beauty would play a gigantic role in the design of that orange juice packaging right now. I know of hardly any international packaging design company who would talk about aesthetics or beauty with their clients. And I think that that's a huge mistake. All right, let's go next. That was a long answer. Sometimes I'm blocked by the expectations that I project about my work and I end up not doing what I wanted. Any recommendation? Yes, absolutely. Great question. Work. I think that all of us are unbelievably prone to overthink projects rather than starting them. I think that I myself for sure, but everybody else, I guess too, that we are all much better off starting, even if it's terrible, and then go from there and improving it or switching to something else than thinking about it. The worst thing is and I suffer from this quite a bit, is this perfectionism that before the idea is not absolutely perfect, better don't start because, oh my God, you could actually create something that you have to admit this mediocre. I think that that's a huge mistake. It's much better to put something mediocre on the paper, on the paper, on the screen, and then try to push it to improve it than it is to overthink it in the beginning. All right. Uh, I have another question here from Sabrina. Uh, is it ever too late to start out as a designer? Actually, I don't think so. There are all sorts of possibilities out there. If I look at uh, my biggest mentor and really hero, the person who was the biggest influence on my design life, his name is Tibor Kalman. He sadly died quite early. Uh, a bit uh, quite a, some time ago. Uh, however, he started very late. I think that he started out, I think he studied sociology, but I'm not 100% sure. And he got to design doing, uh, doing windows for the, for the original Barnes & Noble's bookstore on Fifth Avenue here in New York before it was a chain. And he really wasn't all that educated in the craft of design, meaning when it came to making a layout or leave alone designing anything like a website or but even like a magazine layout, he really couldn't do it. But he definitely knew how to hire people to do it, which had its own advantages because he had that not being able to do certain crafty things enabled him to do all sorts of, uh, to spend his time thinking about it. Now, of course, this kind of strategy works very well when you run your own studio. It probably works less well for a young designer. I would say that if you're a young designer that will go through the regular trajectory of starting as a junior, then a regular designer and so on, you will have to know the craft. And the craft might be digital, so the usual programs, you know, most of them created by, uh, many of them created by Adobe, so Photoshop, InDesign, uh, and Illustrator, 
but then also maybe the craft of being able to program, to create your own digital tools, maybe the craft of drawing. I mean, I was forced in design school to learn how to draw. Uh, I literally only did it because I knew that otherwise I wouldn't be able uh, to study at the university where I wanted to study. And of course, it came in handy ever since, be it that I can show a photographer what kind of layout I really want or that I can quickly draw up a, a, a change for a client or so on. I very rarely use my own illustrations as a final, as a final product in our work. Here and there I do, but ultimately I think I'm not good enough to really, my illustrations are fine for sketching, but not really great as final pieces. Uh, have you ever had moments where your relationship with design worsened and how did you overcome it? Absolutely, yes. I mean, I think that the, obviously the, the entire reason for the first sabbatical was exactly that. My relationship with design is worse. I felt it was repetitive. I felt that uh, other people had more time to experiment. There was a guy uh, called Ed Feller, who I admired, who came to the studio and he had showed this crazy ballpoint pen experiments in his sketchbooks that I just thought were fantastic and I felt I would want to do experiments like this, but uh, it seemed like I didn't really have the time. Uh, and then there were, meaning I think that it definitely went with, with me, it always went up and down. I do have to say that we had over those 27 years, we had years where I felt the work was strong and we had years where we were quite profitable. And because through many of those years, at least through 23 or 24 of those years, I kept a business diary, I now can go really back and see what benefited my soul more. And I would say that years where the quality of the work was high, I was much happier. The, the years that were very that were very lucrative from, from a monetary point of view, I did worse. So it literally it just seemed that that years where I was really happy with the with the quality, well, I never had a year where I was really happy with the quality, but where I was semi happy with the quality, uh, lifted me up. I can't say spiritually, but definitely lifted my overall mood up, my work time mood up or significantly. Next question from Miguel. Uh, who is the person from which you have learned the most and has worked with you? I think uh, I had mentioned it. I think that the, the probably the most influential person in my design life was Tipa Khan, no doubt. Uh, I'm now still very, very much friends with his widow, with Myra Kalman, who is a fantastic artist, illustrator, woman ar about town that is equally impressive and just uh, does wonderful work that is, uh, I don't think that I've ever seen her do a bad piece. Uh, but I'm in awe of many of my colleagues. I would say, like, you know, one that would just come to my mind would be Christoph Niemann, the illustrator, or German illustrator. Or I've known his work. He came over once when he was an intern here in New York. So this must have been, what, 25 years ago. And I've followed his work since, and it's just always good. And I do believe that part of the reason that Christoph's work is so good is because even after all this time, he is still willing to suffer. And it's odd to say this, but I do believe that the stamina, that you're able to reject the first, second, and third idea that you sketch out and say, no, then it has to be something better. Or maybe the form has to be pushed more. 
and more and more like the 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 stamina to sit and say no this still has to be pushed is easy to talk about and very difficult to do in real life because it's painful because it's so much easier to say you know what this is actually quite good uh, i'm pleased with this let's send this to the client or let's publish this uh, i I mean, I've been doing this for such a long time and, and I'm still totally, utterly struggling with this, uh, with this notion. Oh, really, that's just... And I, my guess is that I'm going to struggle with this notion until the end of my days. May they not be around anytime soon. Okay. Uh, I go, can you, from Harshini, uh, can you speak a little bit about the relationship between performance and design? What lies at the intersections of performance and design? Well, we actually, as a studio, tried to go at the edges of the graphic design profession quite frequently. So let's say we did typography that uh, included dancers and uh, that's very, I mean, but we basically we tried out different things. So we would go to performance, we would go to installations, we would go to maybe non-functionality. Uh, there are people, of course, within the design world, uh, there is a, a, a wonderful friend of mine in Holland who creates beautiful dance, related pieces coming from the graphics or typography world uh, that are just impressive and super, uh, I would say, touching. And I always feel that it's, this is sort of my level of judgment within the design world, like, does it touch me? Like, does it actually, you know, steer joy in me? Does it help me? Uh, if it does both or one of those things, it's probably a meaningful piece of, of, of design. Uh, okay, let's see if there is any more questions are uh, going on there. Uh, no, I don't see a new one, uh, but maybe it ha just hasn't been copied yet into uh, into my little uh, chat window that I that I have here. Uh, well, in in the meantime, I would say, well, why don't I talk about the role of design right now? So. I myself have to admit, have not started to create any corona-related work. The reason that that is, is because I also lived and worked through 9-11 and we created a lot, a lot of 9-11 made pieces. Some successful as far as they got a lot of attention some complete disastrous because we couldn't really pull them off the ground. Very, and I had at one time ambitions for very large, for a very large charity that ultimately I was just too slow to develop. Uh, and I myself feel that there's a whole bunch of home bank designers now, thousands and thousands and thousands worldwide, who create corona virus uh, related work. So I feel that kind of, that field is covered well and it probably doesn't need me. I mean, I'm also, you know, of an age now, I'm 57 years old, where I feel that I should do at least some work that I do because I feel nobody else is doing it. And if somebody else is doing it, excellent, but then I don't have to do it. Uh, I definitely felt like this with the beauty exhibition or the beauty book there. I truly felt that outside of Jessica and myself, not a lot of people were sort of like pushing aesthetics right now. 
uh, uh, I do on the said Instagram account, I do review a whole bunch of Corona related work. I would say as a tip, stay away from the obvious cliches. You know, I must have gotten, I don't know, at least a dozen submissions that talked about the social distancing by having, you know, a uh, uh, type where the letters represent that social distancing, meaning like being tracked quite widely. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, that's difficult to make a good piece with such a cliche because by now we've all seen such an, uh, such a you know wide variety of these examples. I think that uh, during 9/11 it was the the twin towers that replaced the number 11 in 9/11 that was sort of the most uh, the most uh, casually used cliche within the graphics world. Okay. Um, um, Christi, uh, Christina says uh, or asks, what's the secret of evolving a small studio into something great together with a partner? Well, uh, uh, basically, Jessica uh, joined the studio as a designer in, if I remember correctly, roughly 2010. So about like, uh, no, it must have been earlier, eight. So maybe like, 10, 11 years ago, worked for us for two years, and she was just so talented. Also, she had such a high degree of common sense that I asked her to become partner, and then we worked together as very close partners for the following eight years. Uh, I think that this, normally, I would not recommend two designers being the head of a small design companies, company. But I think that in our case, it worked truly well because our ultimately our design trajectory was very similar. Like we had a similar interest in, I would say, in design as an emotional entity and something that is not cold. And at the same time, we're quite different from each other. I mean, for one thing, I'm at least, well, maybe not quite double her age, but almost. Uh, male and female, I think that we were able to sort of like cover quite different areas. And we, while we would consult with each other all the time, we really worked truly together on the same job. It was either Jessica's job, or it was my job to basically supervise it. And I think many of you who look at our website, it is not so difficult to differentiate who was in charge of which uh, possibility. And as all things, uh, I mean, for one thing, we always knew that this was time-based, that we are going to do this as long as we both feel this is really a huge advantage for the both of us. And so, about half a year ago, we separated it somewhat. All the commercial work went to uh, Jessica, and we are still working on projects together that come out of the beauty project, considering we created that exhibition really uh, together. All right. Uh, then we have from Gabriel. What's the approach you do on your feedback and selection of works that Instagram people send to you? What's the most important thing you like to look or search at these projects? Okay, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, I'll get about roughly between 10 and 20 entries a day. Uh, I quickly look through them, and I basically choose the ones that I either love and maybe still have something to add on. Or, I mean, some of them are just so good, I don't really have to. There's nothing for me. I have no idea how to improve it, so I might just post that. There's others who are quite good, but could be where I feel they could really benefit from a change or benefit from something to look at or benefit from maybe being made into a series or all sorts of things. So where I basically, where I hope that I can help. Uh, sometimes, but I try to do it rarely, 
I do publish something that I don't like if it allows me to make a point or if it allows me to talk about something that I feel might be worthwhile. And the, I only feature projects that follow the rule. It's the, it's the, the rules are very simple. It needs, to be a, it needs to be shown on a black or on a white background. It has to be sent to my Instagram address. Your Instagram address has to be part of it. And if it has to be sent as a JPEG or if it's a movie as a, as a MOV, as a, uh, as a MOV file. And it's amazing how many, I mean, a significant percentage of the entry that I get or uh, can't follow those rules. So those are basically, sadly, I just, you know, eliminate it. Uh, but uh, by all means, look at the rules. The address is Stefan No Space Sagmeister on Instagram. Uh, look at the, uh, the rules and uh, send me stuff. Uh, I think it's, I actually, enjoy this. Uh, I, the way the process runs is basically I normally answer 10 or 15 at the same time or uh, after I've, or uh, after I chose them and write them all at the same time so that I, uh, when I publish them early in the morning, my time in New York, I don't really have to write them out. Okay, look. Uh, so yeah, let's do a couple of more uh, 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 a poor question. A poor questions. How have you dealt with from Denise? How have you dealt with perfectionism versus deadlines? Hmm, great question. So, I mean, perfectionism can be obviously a benefit and a terrible position or a terrible strategy. Uh, what we always try to do is to set the deadline earlier than it is. So basically, if we tell a client we're going to show a, uh, a presentation in three months from now, our deadline internally really is in two months or in two and a half months, that the whole thing is done. So that we have another two weeks, even though we feel it's done, to really give it a couple of days leave a space in there and then look at it again and see how is this pushable? How can we how can we make this better? Is it formally can it be improved? Color wise, shape wise, material wise, or uh, idea wise, how can this be pushed? Uh, and I think those two in those two weeks we quite often could push a project into the space where we were quite happy with it. Okay, more, one more question. Uh, what do you think about not designing everything from scratch, as in using tools like Adobe Stock for vectors and such to speed up the process? Mm. I think it depends. The, I have to say that we basically use no stock whatsoever unless that's the strategy, meaning like, you know, we did, I don't know, like let's say a photographic cartoon using stock photography kind of as a design direction, as the concept. And then of course we used stock photography that really looked like stock. I, the problem of course with using anything stock, be it clip art or be it illustration or be it uh, photography, is that it's normally quite vanilla and quite common. But let's say I would be opposed if we would do, if we would create a world of three-dimensional uh, three world and there are certain objects in that 3D world that, you know, that already exist like a bottle or so, or a desk or things, I probably wouldn't be opposed to that. But uh, in general, we tend to design things from scratch. Okay. Uh, then I have a message here. Uh, concluding can wrap up with some advice. Good wishes for the co creative community. Wow. You know what? I think an advice 
that you can try out right after this. And that just basically worked brilliantly for me time after time again is a technique to come up with ideas. So basically, normally, if I would come up with an idea, I would, I don't know, can somebody quickly write a project in here that write a project in that you're working on and that you need an idea for? And I will try to create an idea in here in the last minute. So uh, basically, normally, if I would create an idea, I would look at that field. I would look at the competition. I would research what my what my family would like about that stuff. Uh, I would, uh, and ultimately, likely, my idea would be somewhat similar to the things that are already out there. So let's, uh, OK, let's pick something. Let's say you have to design a pair of gloves. Uh, and so instead of when you're, when you're thinking about the pair of gloves, instead of looking at all the other pairs of gloves and looking at Behance and online how other gloves look like, let's say I would say I would completely forget about the gloves and create and start thinking about gloves with something that has nothing to do with uh, with the gloves, normally by looking around my space and picking something at random. So, OK, I'm looking at gloves with starting with this espresso cup. It's a used espresso cup, as you can see. So, OK, I'm designing gloves. I can pour something in it, hot liquid. OK, so can I design a glove that is heatable, where I have this, where I have a double glove, sort of like the kind of, the kind of gloves that I've seen in, uh, in Alaska. Uh, this was not gloves I've seen. Uh, uh, very heavy ice shoes in Alaska that had a double wall that was filled with oil. So maybe this is possible to make a glove like this. So I have a double glove and it is filled either with grease or oil or maybe even with a fluid that has this heating possibility that it can be cracked and then is heated. I would look into that. Not bad. I would have never come up with this if I wouldn't have started with this espresso cup. This technique has been created by a very smart guy called Edward de Bono. And he is an advisor for governments and very large, uh, very large companies. He's a philosopher from Malta. And this thing really works. I think I created or we created dozens and dozens of projects like it. Much better, much better technique than going online and looking at other things down that same. Or from that same pattern. Okay, uh, I would say it was a pleasure talking to you all. Uh, I hope you are being safe. Watch out for the next couple of weeks. Uh, create beautiful work, and I wish all the best for all of you. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thanks. Bye-bye.